Let's look at a bit of chapter four where we get Anne's backstory with the free indirect style communicating simultaneously Lady Russell's opinion and Anne's own opinion on the prospect of marriage to Frederick Wentworth eight years ago. Captain Wentworth had no fortune. He had been lucky in his profession, but spending freely what had come freely had realized nothing. But he was confident that he should soon be rich. Full of life and ardor, he knew that he should soon have a ship, and soon be on a station that would lead to everything he wanted. He had always been lucky. He knew he should be so still. Such confidence, powerful in its own warmth, and bewitching in the wit which often expressed it, must have been enough for Anne. But Lady Russell saw it very differently. His sanguine temper and fearlessness of mind operated very differently on her. She saw in it but an aggravation of the evil. It only added a dangerous character to himself. He was brilliant. He was headstrong. Lady Russell had little taste for wit, and of anything approaching to imprudence or horror. She deprecated the connection in every light. There are several voices in this narrative. It varies tonally in a way that makes it seem like it is coupled together from the thoughts of various characters, rather than simply a single person's narration. We start off with a kind of basic narration, the fact that Wentworth, I quote, had no fortune. Nobody, it seems, could dispute that, or alter the assessment by force of opinion. He simply didn't have much money. But then this other voice comes in, this more judgmental voice that refers to him spending freely. He realized nothing, which means that he didn't convert his success into lasting or tangible assets such as property. And these opinions, which I put in red text, have the tone of an older person, such as Lady Russell, who has a cynical view of Wentworth's charm. Such confidence, bewitching, dangerous, headstrong. And yet interwoven with these views are more positive perspectives which are likely Wentworth's own. These are in green. The confidence in his own good fortune. He had been lucky. He knew that he should soon have a ship, and the certainty that he would get everything he wanted. So there's a back and forth in this passage, like an unspoken dialogue on Wentworth's situation in life. It's an exchange between Wentworth and Lady Russell that never happens, although we suspect that these voices did go back and forth in Anne's head in such a manner when she was 19. It serves to dramatize Anne's inner turmoil over what to do. She listens to other people and found their voices in conflict. If we read that passage as a stitching together of various voices, it's significant that Anne's own voice is almost entirely missing. This is evidence again of how she is a marginalized figure, even strangely in debates over her own future, and it confirms her tendency to defer to the opinion of Lady Russell. And I want to repeat the point from last week about this main character being one who is frequently pushed aside. It's clarified to us here in another way by Anne being crowded out by other speakers. The hint of Anne's attraction to Wentworth, the scant evidence of her own opinion, is perhaps in reference to Wentworth's sanguine temper and fearlessness of mind, attributes that might make him likable to another person, rather than an encapsulation of how he perceives himself or how Lady Russell perceives him. To continue... Such opposition as these feelings produced was more than Anne could combat. Young and gentle as she was, it might yet have been possible to withstand her father's ill will, though unsoftened by one kind word or look on the part of her sister. But Lady Russell, whom she had always loved and relied on, could not, with such steadiness of opinion and such tenderness of manner, be continually advising her in vain. She was persuaded to believe the engagement a wrong thing, indiscreet, improper, hardly capable of success, and not deserving it. But it was not a merely selfish caution under which she acted in putting an end to it. Had she not imagined herself consulting his good even more than her own, she could hardly have given him up. The belief of being prudent and self-denying, principally for his advantage, was her chief consolation. Here we do get Anne's voice, an uncertain one, full of hesitant punctuation, with anxiety centering on words always and in vain. Quote, Lady Russell, whom she had always loved and relied on, could not, with such steadfastness of opinion and such tenderness of manner, be continually advising her in vain. And this line of thought is terminated by that keyword. She was persuaded to believe the engagement a wrong thing. The reintroduction of Lady Russell's sentiments as explanation. We imagine the older woman using these very words to the young girl. 
indiscreet, improper, hardly capable of success and not deserving it. Finally, there is evidence of internal monologue, and speaking to herself, the belief of being prudent and self-denying principally for his advantage was her chief consolation. We infer from Wentworth's resentment towards Anne in the first volume of the novel that an important dialogue has not taken place. There has never been a frank explanation of Anne's refusal eight years ago. She has never given her reasons. Wentworth was banished from the scene and hence Wentworth's voice is absent from this stage of the consideration. So think of all that has been accomplished in those two paragraphs we just looked at. Essential background plotting is established. We understand the characters, what their motives were, and even how they speak. And we comprehend how the main character is often sidelined in debate and subject to conflicting opinions on her future. To describe the narrative voice more fully, I suggest we might integrate some further terms like polyphonic to imply that there are many voices and even ventriloquism to take on Austen's tendency to assume other people's voices within the same narrative, and agile to represent the ease with which the narrator moves from one character's voice to the other within a short space. Next, I want to look at an excerpt from chapter 15, and this deals with the social rehabilitation of William Eliot when he's welcomed back into the circle, so to speak. The background is that he had, some years ago, treated the family disrespectfully by courting Elizabeth, then breaking off contact and marrying someone else. But recently widowed, William Eliot changes his tune after meeting Anne and taking a fancy to her. In Bath, Anne hears how William and her family have been reconciled. He was not only pardoned, they were delighted with him. He had explained away all the appearance of neglect on his own side. It had originated in misapprehension entirely. He had never had any idea of throwing himself off. He had feared that he was thrown off, but knew not why, and delicacy had kept him silent. Upon the hint of having spoken disrespectfully or carelessly of the family and the family honours, he was quite indignant. He, who had ever boasted of being an Elliot, and whose feelings as to connection were only too strict to suit the unfeudal tone of the present day. He was astonished, indeed, but his character and general conduct must refute it. He could refer Sir Walter to all who knew him, and certainly, the pains he had been taking on this, the first opportunity of reconciliation, to be restored to the footing of a relation and heir presumptive, was a strong proof of his opinions on the subject. Again, the narrative is complex, but in different ways from the passage I looked at earlier. There are really four layers to this paragraph. The narrator reports what Anne hears Elizabeth tell of what William Eliot said. And this is typical of the narrative in Persuasion. Characters react to the reported speech of other characters, and they gauge each other's reactions to things that have been relayed to them, rather than addressed to them directly. To complicate things further, in this paragraph, the information reaches us readers via more than one exchange involving characters who are probably not very reliable. And we may have trouble telling whose voice is whose, because both sides of the argument are desperate to be reconciled for their own reasons. William, of course, wanting to be closer to the family so he can dissuade Sir Walter from the lures of Mrs. Clay, or any other action that will disinherit him from Kellynch Hall. Consider the effect of all the very British sounding modifiers in that paragraph. Modifiers are additional words that alter the meaning of the words to which they are attached. And here the modifiers create an air of exaggeration, quite indignant, never had an idea, only too strict. The first opportunity of reconciliation, a strong proof of his opinions. This is the language of William Eliot's righteous indignation. It makes us sceptical about what is being said. It's inflated, hypocritical, insincere, protesting too much. The narrator reproduces this excessive phrasing as a kind of mockery, with Anne's exasperation represented in passing by a great deal. It's a subtle humour in which a single unnecessary word here or there, as in the reproduction of these modifiers, casts cynical doubt on what has been said versus what is actually meant.